thank everyone for coming out <clears throat> uh, to take part in service today with us. And uh, looking forward to what God's going to do here this morning. So let's go to Lord in prayer and we'll go ahead and open up. Lord Jesus, we just thank you so much, God, for just uh, the, another opportunity, Lord, for us to meet back in uh, this sanctuary here, Lord, God, together. Uh, to hear from you, to worship and lift praise unto you, Lord. And God, I just pray this morning that whatever the need is, Lord, uh, that God, it will be granted this morning and God, we would receive what it is we need. Uh, now, I pray that the Spirit has liberty, Lord, to move uh, in and out of these pews and aisles, Lord. God, seeking those and, and dealing with hearts this morning, Lord. And God, that we'd be receptive to what the Spirit leads and puts within us, Lord. Now, God, you just have your way in this. In your precious and holy name, we do pray. Amen. All right, grab your big red book there and turn over page number 121. We'll all stand and sing a little bit of Heaven's Jubilee, 121. <laughs> shall see Jesus in the air, coming after you and me, joys lives to share, what rejoicing there will be when the saints shall rise, headed for that jubilee yonder in the sky, what a day of singing, what a day of shouting, on that happy morning when we all shall gladly rise, what a day of glory, glory, hallelujah, glory when we meet our blessed Savior Seems that now I almost see all the sainted dead Rising for that jubilee that is just ahead In the twinkling of an eye, church begin to be All the living saints to fly to that jubilee What a day of singing, what a day of shouting On that happy morning when we all shall gladly rise Sing, singing in the Holy Ghost, how the heavens will ring. Millions there will join the song, with them we shall be. Praising Christ through ages long, heaven's jubilee. What a day of singing, what a day of shouting. On that happy morning when we all shall gladly rise. What a day of glory, glory, hallelujah, glory. When we meet our blessed Savior in the sky. This morning, you may be seated. Uh, by way of announcements in the bulletin this morning, um, there is a Trail Life Leaders meeting uh, after service day uh, back there in the uh, Sunday school room by my office. Um, and that'll start just soon as service is over with. Also, coming up this Tuesday night, uh, if you would like to um, go to uh, the terrific Tuesday, uh, Brother Jeff Labor will be there preaching at Oakland Baptist in Corinth. Uh, it starts at 6.30. The van will be leaving at 4. That will give us a little time to get there. And also we'll be uh, eating at the dinner bell there um, and then head over to the church. Uh, also starting this Wednesday night, uh, we are starting our new program for the kids and the youth. Uh, this will be our WANA program. Uh, so uh, service for them will start at 6 o'clock uh, and not 6.30. Um, the adults will still be meeting at 6.30. Uh, but for the kids, uh, we will be eating from 5.30. Uh, to right up to six, and then we will be headed into class afterwards. Uh, then uh, the, the 12th, which is not tomorrow night, but the next Monday night, uh, Trail Life Open House will be taking place here at 6 p.m. And then also at the end of the month, uh, Brother C.T. Townsend will be preaching down at Wheeler Growth in Corinth, Mississippi as well. Uh, Van will be leaving at 5 on that one, and he'll be preaching there Monday and Tuesday night. Uh, and then the last Saturday of the month, uh, we'll be having a fish fry and singing with uh, Lifeline, and uh, the food will start at 5, and singing will start after that uh, roughly around 6. Is there any other announcements or anything to be made this morning? Are we doing a business meeting this afternoon? We are doing a business meeting this afternoon. <laughs> yes, business meeting tonight, 5 o'clock. Uh, anything else? 
All right. With that being said, then we'll go ahead and continue on. Don't forget about uh, the prayer list on the back, though. If you need to add anybody to that, text them to me or uh, jot it down and hand it to me, and I will get them added to you. All right. Grab that big red hymnal there again. We'll flip over to page number 18 and do a little bit of the Glory Land way. We'll all stand and sing. Page number 75, Power in the Blood. We'll do the first, second, last verse. And on that last course, we'll throw in as many powers as we can get in there. See if y'all are awake this morning. Pa, 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 
Amen. We'll go ahead and uh, have our ushers to get prepared there, and we'll take up morning offering this morning. We'll go to the Lord in prayer and just ask him to bless this offering and to use it to further his kingdom and ministry here at Darwin Baptist. Brother Danny Montgomery, will you text your Lord in prayer, please, sir? Amen. Amen. Page number 38, further along. sing baby gunner they asked to do my jesus this morning
they want to do as well. Sixteen, 
get the church out of me.
and you can sing a song. Well, my God delivered me, heard me while on my knees. My God was on the scene, he set me free. Oh, I'm going to praise his name, no, I am not ashamed. I'm standing here because God delivered me. Friend, I walked that lonely mile, waiting through test and trial, wondering if God had forsaken me, but that's when I heard him say, In his eye be not afraid. Oh, what a glorious day when God delivered me. Well, my God delivered me, heard me while on my knees. My God was on the scene, he said. Don't 
deserve it And I know I couldn't earn it Let mercy rain down on this desperate man I've been the one on the left full of guilt and regret Long gone on the wrong side of living I've been the one on the right Always looking for a fight Thinking I could never be forgiven I'm standing here today overwhelmed by grace Cause I know who paid my cost
thankful to know that we can trust in God and know that he will not fail. Amen. And so many times we tend to uh, forget that. Uh, uh, we, we, we think that, you know, God's done it in the past, but we forget to remember that he's still there in our present and our future. And, and we, we need to look back at times and, and remember when we're facing the hard times, when we're facing the rough uh, patches of life, or when we're just facing uncertain days, you know, we can know that God is there. And, and, and the best thing about that is not only is he there, but he's already been ahead. He's already went before, praise God. He's already went before you and prepared the path for you to walk. So even when you're in the midst of where you're at right now, and you may think that there is no hope and there is no light and there is no way and it is impossible to continue on, he has already went before you and prepared every step for you to take. So when you think that you are stepless, know this, that God holds every step. Praise God. He holds every step in his hand. Amen, amen. We just want to go right on and get into it. Exodus chapter number 15 this morning. Praise God. Uh, Matt, this is exactly what he's got on my heart this morning. Uh, 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 it, it's just simply that right there, following God, understanding God, knowing when God moves. Uh, and, and even when you're in the midst of hard times, uh, that, that you don't go complaining and you don't go uh, 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 griping and fussing and looking at the negative, uh, but yet you hit your knees and say, God, here I am. Now get me through. Uh, I know you led me this far, so God, I know you're not going to give up on me now. Praise God. Amen. Uh, Ezekiel, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Exodus chapter number 15, starting in verse 22, and we'll read through the end of the chapter. Uh, and uh, uh, we'll stand in the, reading, uh, uh, in the reading of God's word this morning, uh, if you're physically able. Starting there in verse number 22, it says, uh, So Moses brought Israel uh, from the Red Sea, and they went out into the wilderness of Shur, uh, and they went three days in the wilderness uh, and found no water. And when they came to Marah, they could not drink of the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it is called Marah. And the people murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And he cried, Moses, unto the Lord. And the Lord showed him a tree, which when he had cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet, there he made them uh, a statue and an ordinance, uh, and there he proved them. Uh, and he said, uh, and said, If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and wilt do that which is right in his sight, uh, and wilt give ear to his commandments, uh, and keep his statutes, uh, I will put none of these diseases upon you which I have brought uh, unto Egypt, uh, for I am. Oh my the God, or I am the Lord that healeth thee. And they came to Elam, where there were twelve wells of water and threescore and ten palm trees, and they encamped there by the waters. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you this morning for the reading of your word. And God, as we began to preach here this morning, what you've laid upon my heart, God, I pray that you would use me and help me, God, to be able to speak this morning with the words that you've laid upon me, God, uh, that they may go forth and encourage and help uh, and strengthen and, and offer peace. Uh, and God, uh, whatever it is this morning, uh, we're giving it to you, Lord, and I pray uh, that you can use me, uh, hide me behind the cross, Lord, uh, and God, give me strength, God, to do exactly what you've called me to do this morning. God, we ask all this in your precious and holy name, and amen. Amen. You may be seated this morning. Uh, to, to let you know where we are uh, in Exodus here, uh, in this uh, uh, bottom part of 15, uh, know that just in uh, the previous chapter or so, uh, uh, Israel had just been uh, let go by Pharaoh from Egypt. 
and they have been led out by Moses uh, and all of a sudden uh, on their journey out and we're talking uh, a, a ton of people here uh, and on their way out and as they're leaving uh, God uh, gave them the ability to spool uh, Egypt and take money uh, and jewels and all this uh, provision uh, and, and, and stuff that they would need uh, to help them on their journey uh, uh, and, and God allowed that to take place and they didn't even have a weapon in hand. Usually when you spool a people, it's because you have beat them in war and, and then you take what they have to enrich you further and your kingdom or, or, or whatever. But here, the battle was not theirs, praise God. Somebody ought to shout with me here. But the battle was God's and so therefore they didn't have to raise the first sword. They didn't have to raise the first fist. They didn't have to raise nothing. All they done was raised in praise God, raised an ear unto God and an obedient heart and God laid it in their lap, amen. And now they're headed out and they're going, leaving Egypt and then all of a sudden they see in front of them and behind them obstacles that take place. They see before them uh, that they have now been ran into this little area here uh, and the only way out uh, is to swim across this sea. The only way out is somehow to get across the sea, but they know that they can't get the animals. Uh, they can't get the carts. Uh, they can't get the babies and the young children. Uh, and so they turn around and look and all of a sudden, there comes the enemy. Egypt has decided uh, that they wanted them back, but God, but God, and, and that's exactly what is taking place here is God knew that there was going to be a Red Sea in front of them and he knew that he was going to have Egypt come behind them because here's what God wanted them to see. He did not want them to see the miracle of the waters party. He did not want them to see uh, just the dry ground that they walked upon. He did not want them to see the miraculous things. Here is the sole thing I believe that God wanted them to see. You can trust in me. You can trust in me. I've got you all the way through. And so we see here that, that, that they finally get across the Red Sea. And, and that takes place in chapter 13. And the chapter 13 and chapter 14, we see praise being given to God as the waters have come forth and now taking care of the enemy permanently. And they are no longer having to face the, 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 the army of Egypt here. And they are singing praise. Matter of fact, it says that Mary and Moses' sister with the timoral and the other ladies, they dance and sang praise unto God. Now, I know if some of y'all danced in here right now, uh, it would be a miracle, right? Because to, uh, if you anything like me, you got two left feet, uh, and some of us have been raised up that it's, uh, uh, it, it's indignified uh, to move yourself uh, in showing glory to God and giving him praise. Uh, here's the deal. It's okay uh, to allow yourself to express praise unto God as long as it is reverent. Amen. I'm not talking about going out here doing the boot scoot and boogie and that sort of thing in the church house. Uh, we ain't going to do that sort of stuff. But uh, when God moves upon you uh, and there goes something happening, I've seen Beverly get up here and she looks like a bull, red in the eyes, praise God. Uh, and she's standing there against whatever is coming up and she goes to paw in that ground. Praise God, it used to happen all the time. I think in the older years, uh, she's got tired of Paul and she's just decided to stand. <laughs> amen, amen. She hit 70 uh, uh, this year, so, you know, it's, it's one of those things. Uh, 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 she's still ahead of Sparky, praise God. Uh, uh, but anyways, uh, uh, but, but, but that's what I'm talking about, that praise. Let it come forth. Uh, don't think that raising your hand uh, or stomping your feet uh, or clapping in your hands or, or swaying side to side or however it is as long as it is reverent unto God then you express it. Amen. 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 And so we see here uh, that Moses and his sister Miriam and all the people were singing and praising God uh, and now as we picked up in verse number 22 
It says that Moses led them into the wilderness of Shur. And it says when they got to the wilderness of Shur, they had been there three days journey uh, from the Red Sea. Uh, and all of a sudden, uh, there was no water to be found. Now, in your and my mind, uh, this is not necessarily a big deal uh, just because we have the convenience of running water everywhere we go. Amen. But back then, they did not. Uh, water was a very uh, 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 fixture uh, uh, of, simple, uh, of life. If there was no water, then there was no life. And that is why uh, back in that time and all the way up through uh, uh, just here recently in the past couple of centuries, uh, that that every city that ever took place that was built up uh, was either on a river or right next to a river because water equals life. And, and here's what I find so interesting about this. I mean, we can really dig deep into what is going on right here, and we can see uh, that water equals life, uh, but the last obstacle they faced was water. And what they thought water was going to do there was not bring forth life, but bring forth death. As this uh, 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 Pharaoh's army became uh, upon them there, uh, and they thought, well, we're either going to have to surrender or drown one way or the other, but that's what we're going to have to do. Now they are three days in the wilderness, uh, and they are without water, and now it's bringing forth what they think is death. They can't find water. Now, I want you to see this right here. Now, you and I, we know the rest of the story. We've already read it. We know the end of the book if you've read the Bible. You know how things are going to play out. You know all this stuff. But these people were experiencing it firsthand. They weren't just going back and reading this stuff. These people had walked into the wilderness uh, three days. Uh, they've got babies. They've got animals. Uh, they've got older people. They're in the desert, and they have found no water. And these people, what God was trying to do, uh, and I don't want to get ahead of myself, but what God was trying to do, uh, they were not submissive to. They were not understanding uh, what God was trying to do within them. And all of a sudden, uh, it says there that they began to complain. They began to murmur. Now, that word murmur there, it means a little bit more than just complain. It means to have a direct defiance against authority. Now, I want you to see this. Direct defiance against authority. And Moses was the one that God chose to lead them. And when they came against Moses, because he was God's man, not only were they against him, but they were also against God. Amen. Amen. God chose Moses to lead them, and when they came against Moses, it was an automatic, direct line to God, uh, and their defiance was there against Moses and uh, God. And so they began to complain, they began to murmur, they began to, uh, 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 you know, uh, get beside themselves uh, and all this sort of stuff. And the entire time, this is what God was trying to do. Through the trip in of three days, um, uh, uh, and uh, man, you can really dig deep in this. Uh, we could talk about the three days, and we could talk about uh, the third day of Christ uh, and what took place there. Uh, we can see that where death was on the third day, life came. For, praise God. That's good, too. I mean, you can really seek deep down into this, but here's what God was trying to get them to understand. These were a young, babyish people that have been under the Egyptian Pharaoh as slaves for 400 years. They have been there for generations. They had been there for a long time. They had never seen uh, what God can do because those that were with God before they went in have already died out. The people that were existing now simply only had stories, uh, and, and, and I'm sure those stories were probably squashed out uh, by the oppression of the slavery that was upon them. Uh, and so finally, uh, there was somebody, uh, a group, uh, a small group that said, uh, I remember the words of our fathers and forefathers uh, saying that God will rescue us and God will be with us. Uh, let us cry out unto God. Uh, let us cry out unto Yahweh. Uh, let us cry out unto Jehovah. And when we do, then he will have to turn his ear to us. Uh, and we know that's exactly what took place because God sent them refuge and rescue. Amen. Amen. 
And so we see this, uh, that, that, that because they were young, uh, they had not been guided or leaded. Uh, God did not just take them straight to the promised land, but God was taking them through Maras in their life. And you may think, that is not, why would God do something like that? Why would God allow uh, difficulties? Why would God allow hardships? Why would God allow uh, uh, bitter waters in their lives, knowing uh, that they need to be able to drink? They need to be able to live. They need to be able to uh, uh, get there. Why would, here's the deal. God was teaching them step by step on how to rely on Here's the whole synopsis of what we have read. The Red Sea was the lesson. The three days into the wilderness of Shur and finding Mara, the bitter water, was the test. Will they see this water being bitter and fall upon their knees and call upon God because God rescued them and showed them what path they should take at the Red Sea? then God can continue to do so in their lives. What choice will they make? Will they make the choice of, okay, God's done it in the past, therefore, whatever obstacle I come against, the only thing I got to do is not worry. The only thing I got to do is not get mad. The only thing I got to do is not get angry. The only thing I got to do is get my mind out of here and get my heart connected with there. Amen. Amen. And so that was the test that they were at here. And all of a sudden we see that their trip and their trouble had now led them to their test. And, we, and all of a sudden they are failing miserably. They are failing in such a way. Every single person, you can read it right there for you in verse number 24, I believe it is. It says that what they done was gripped and complained and become defiant and disrespectful to Moses, which indirectly is also to God. But you can see in the very next verse when they are attacking and coming against Moses because they are seeing this in a negative light, where does Moses go? Moses doesn't give it back to them. Amen. How many of y'all ever been in a shape like that? Somebody come at you, guns are blazing, and all of a sudden uh, flesh takes over. You get yourself in a bind because uh, you they are hurting you. Uh, I, I talked about, I ju- I've just done some marriage counseling and we were talking about that between a husband and a wife. Uh, and sometimes in situations when we have hurt the other, uh, we begin to hurt back because uh, they have hurt us. And so it becomes that almost tick for tack thing. You hurt me, so I'm going to hurt you. But all that does is bring hurt to the marriage. And all that does is bring hurt to the relationship, depending on where you're at. Uh, You should never hurt somebody because you're hurting. Amen. I know that's hard to hear because that is our defense mechanism. That is our flesh. That is how we handle things. Uh, But that is not how God desires us to handle things. God desires for us to have a forgiving heart. God does not, we talked about that in Sunday school this morning. Forgiveness is not for the other person. It is for you because without forgiveness, what that other person has done to you now has control over you. And I believe as Cassie said, her mama used to tell her that when you allow people to have control of you because you haven't forgiven them, then you're allowing them to live rent free in your mind. And how many of you know that your mind is not a place for anybody to be but God? Amen, amen. When Satan gets footholds in your life, uh, it's not in the physical, it's not in the body, it's in the mind. Uh, That's where it starts. And as long as he can get that foothold in that mind, then you better believe the body will follow after. So uh, 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 Moses, in this situation where they were coming against him, uh, he knew what he needed to do at that point. Uh, he did not lash out. He did not get mad. He did not uh, 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 you know, slap a couple of them in the face or anything of the sort. Uh, no, Moses, it says that he cried out to God cried out to God. Now, I don't want you to miss that either because even in this test, how many of you ever in school, you took a test and then the teacher saw that the majority of the class did not pass the test and so therefore, you took the test and she gave it back to you and you went through every question and you began to answer them aloud and she began to explain to you why those questions are wrong and here's the right answer and then at the very end, she says, now everybody change your grade. 
change your grade. Now, I know that probably don't happen often, but, but I've been through that a couple of times uh, as I've been in school. And I thought, you know, that is so weird. I, I don't understand that because that's not what I made. But here's the deal. The, the, the teacher wasn't concerned about the test. She was concerned about what I understood. Amen. Y'all understand that she was concerned about what I understood. And so therefore, God was not concerned with the test of the people. God was concerned with the heart of the people. And so here, this right here, it's almost as if Moses was being that teacher that was uh, showing them in a very real way that this is how you handle these situations. This is the answer to the test. You don't gripe and complain and fuss uh, and just get mad at God and all the. This is how you do it. Uh, you fall on your knees and you cry out to him and say, God, you put us here. God, I know you're going to supply. God, I'm just trusting in you. And that's what Moses done. And all of a sudden, God spoke to him and said, Moses, I know the water's bitter, but I've made a way. And so, and I think that God, God is doing these things. Uh, not, not uh, you know, in the beginning, I told you that at the Red Sea, it wasn't about the dry ground. It wasn't about the waters uh, up and the fish were swimming around and all that miraculous stuff. It was simply about the obedience and trusting. Okay? But know this. When the obedience and trusting come in then you're allowed to see the miraculous. Now, that's good. Don't miss that. I think a lot of people miss the miraculous in their lives because they aren't trusting, because they are not relying, because they are not obedient to God. And so they miss out on miracles in their life every day because they choose to handle it in the wrong way, because they choose to face it in the wrong way. Now, now, now they see Moses, and Moses falls down, and he cries out to God, Oh, God. You see what situation you're in. This is no surprise to you. I know you're going to fix this. You just let me know if I need to do anything. Use me if you need to. And that's when God speaks to him and says, Moses, there's a tree right over yonder. And I want you to go get that thing. And I want you to take it. And I want you to throw it in the bitter waters. And when you throw it in the bitter waters, then it's going to make those waters sweet. Now, don't lose me here. I see y'all. Y'all, y'all, I'm, I'm looking at you like you're look, supposed to be looking at me. Pay attention right here because I don't want you to miss this. The waters were made sweet by a tree. <laughs> the bitterness of sin is made, this is good. The bitterness of sin is made sweet by the cross and the payment that was given upon it by Jesus himself. And so here's the deal. God looked down and what he was doing for them in a very physical way here, God says, I know that the sea of sin that they're in, they cannot get out of. That bitterness that they're in, they cannot get away from. But I will send the one that will die upon the tree that when it is cast in, Take it a step further right here. When it's cast in, what does it say whenever Jesus was on the cross? It says that all sin was applied to him. All sin was applied to him. A sinless man that hung and died and paid death price for you and for me and for all that's ever existed and ever will exist. Sin, that bitter sea of sin that he had never tasted, he had never been in. Now Jesus has plunged head first into so that he may save you and me out of it and change our bitter, bitter sinful water into something sweet. Into something sweet. So, so I got to thinking about this and I got to thinking about the lesson and, and the principles that God was trying to teach here to, to uh, uh, the Israelites. He was trying to train them to understand that when they begin to face adversity, when they began to face uh, uh, issues, you don't lose sight of me then. You were good with me and praising me over here uh, when, when, when you were outside of adversity, when you were rescued from it, when you're on the other side of it. Uh, but even in the midst of it, you can still rely upon me. You can still trust me. You can still uh, 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 be obedient even in the midst of this hardship. Now, I want you to know this was a very hard lesson for Israel to learn because really they never learned it. They never learned it. Matter of fact, you know how I know that? Because I've read the story. I know what it says. It says that all those people that come out of Egypt, 
They wandered in the wilderness for 40 years because they were disobedient. Time after time after time after time. They get over there and they're about to go into the promised land. They send 10 spies in uh, uh, and all of a sudden two of them come out with good reports. Uh, the rest of them come out with an awful report and so therefore they do not go in and God says, okay, fine. I've taught you time after time from the Red Sea experience uh, and I don't even want to just say the Red Sea experience. What about all the plagues that took place over here in Egypt? You watched my miracles there. And not only this, but every miracle that you watched there, but that become dest uh, destruction to Egypt never affected you. <laughs> see, see, a lot of times if you're not careful, you'll just write this story off uh, because it's just you get the bare basics when you're a kid growing up sometimes. But here's the deal. Every plague that came forth unto Egypt never affected Israel. Because God had a hedge upon them. Until the very last plague, when it was the plague of the firstborn dying. And God says, here it is. I want you to take a lamb and I want you to sacrifice it. And I want you to take the blood and apply it to the door. Both post and the mantle, the top. He says, I want you to apply it. And he says this right here, and I love this because it is nothing more than a fantastic foreshadowing of what is to come in the New Testament that is offered on the cross, that, that precious grace that is given unto us. The Bible says that anyone that is found under, under the blood will be saved. And I want you to know that the message in the Old Testament has not changed in the New Testament. It is still the exact same message. Anyone that is found under the blood of Jesus Christ is saved. Those that are not under the blood, uh, that is our job to show them, uh, to be a witness, to be uh, live a testimony unto them that the blood is what matters. The blood is what matters. So they've seen these miracles here. They seen firsthand for themselves as they get cornered at the Red Sea what God can do. And God is teaching them step by step how to trust in God. How to trust in God. Here's the deal. As I was thinking about this, and I thought, you know, I sometimes I'm just illustrative. You know, I need a picture. I need a, uh, a you know, something to really grab onto. And I got to thinking about a tea bag. And, and, and that tea bag there, uh, when you hold on to that tea bag, uh, that tea bag, you have no idea how it's going to taste. Ain't got a clue. You don't know what's going to take place. You don't know anything about it until it what? Goes into the water. You stick that tea bag in hot water and all of a sudden, uh, uh, it creates a drink. Now that drink, you don't know whether it's bitter or whether it tastes sweet. You have no idea. Now here in the South, we automatically know it's going to be bitter. Because we've got to add at least two cups of sugar, if not three, to every gallon. That was a good spot to say amen. <laughs> to every gallon of tea that we make. If it's not coming out like molasses, then we don't want it. Amen. It's got to be sweet. Uh, I, you know, people don't understand it, but I understand it because the Bible says, Oh, taste and, <laughs> oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. And I like to add in there too, Oh, taste and see that the tea is good. Amen. It's got to be good and it's going to be good sweet because the Bible teaches us that the water in Mar was bitter. Uh, and when Jesus was added to the water, when sugar's added to it, it becomes sweet. Uh, and that is why church you ought to drink sweet tea <laughs> amen amen <laughs> Amy I'm there with you honey I don't drink it anymore either but it's because I'm fat it's not because I'm diabetic or anything of the sort <laughs> it's because I try to watch that sugar intake sometimes Jesus is all the sugar I need <laughs> I was hoping for a little bit more uh, enthusiasm there but it's all right y'all get it in just a minute but anyways, I got thinking about that, and I got to think about that tea bag going in there. And I used to make tea all the time. I made it to my grandparents, my, my aunt uh, uh, on, on my, my dad's uh, sister-in-law. I, I would go uh, down there and spend time with my cousins, me and my, my brother would, and, and we'd spend a lot of time there, and that's all we drank was sweet tea. And, and I love the way she used to do it, right? Because when you got ready for sweet tea and you emptied the pitcher, the next person in line didn't get nothing because you had to go bullet on the stove. 
And, and, and you could have a couple of pictures in the fridge, but you can only keep so many pictures in there with everything else. So my aunt, uh, uh, I, I, God gave her wisdom. I don't know how she thought about it, but she did. She used to take those old uh, big peanut butter jars, and she cleaned those jokers out, uh, and the whole side of that door was packed full of these peanut butter jars. And, and, and so what she would do is she would take time in the beginning, and she would bull up a pitcher or a gallon of tea, and in that, that economy size, not the small size, but that economy size peanut butter jar, some of y'all take notes, you're going to need this. You know, uh, uh, you may have an event coming up and this will help you out. Uh, in that economy size peanut butter jar, uh, she would take and she would dump her two to two and a half cups of sugar in that jar. And then on the stove, she would have a pot boiling with that tea inside of it. And she would take that tea once it got through boiling and got, its, uh, 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 got everything out of it and it was ready. She would take that hot tea and pour it inside of that peanut butter jar. And guess what? That sugar began to dissolve. And so now you, you really do. You got syrup is what it is. It's just liquid tea syrup. And it's all mixed in there together and that it dissolves up and everything. She'd shake it or whatever. She'd let it set out for a few minutes, let it cool down just a little bit. And then she'd start lining that refrigerator door with them. And you know what, Brother Mickey? I found out <laughs> that whenever you got thirsty and you went in to get some tea and, and the pitcher wasn't enough to fill your cup up, all you had to do was take the res <laughs> <laughs> All you had to do was reach in the door and grab the reserve, throw it in the pitcher, and just add water. Now, guess what? With tea, like I said, you had to wait on it to boil, and then it was hot when it come off, and I know us Southerners, we do not drink hot tea. The majority of us don't. The ones that are saved don't. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding, Cole. <laughs> we'll let you in. You can be an honorary, <laughs> safe person. <laughs> but anyways, uh, you would take that jar out of the refrigerator. It was already cold. You would throw it in the pitcher and add cold water to it, and you could drink it straight up right then. Fantastic. Here's what I want to use with that right there. God has got the peanut butter jars in the door of the refrigerator. And every time you come to a spot where there ain't no more sweet tea left, every time you come to a spot where it seems like you are empty and it's bitter, all you got to do <laughs> is <laughs> reach in. <laughs> Don't miss that. That's the most important. <laughs> Gives me chills thinking about it. Reach in to God's goodness. Reach in to God himself and say, God, I see where I'm at. The pitcher's empty. The, it, it, it seems bitter right now. But God, I know that my bitterness can made, be made sweet if I just simply get connected to you. Your life, what do you choose to do with it when you come against these trials and these tests? Do you become bitter or do you become better? Do you become bitter or do you find beneficial things within it that God is teaching you? It's all in how you look at it. The Israelites, that's what they were being taught through this. And I would dare to say that God is still the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if God worked like that then, then I know he's still working like that now. So everything that you come to may not be a hardship, but it may be a test. And that test is not there to hurt you, but it's there to continue to hone in your faith in God, to strengthen your relationship with God. The same God that was with them at the Red Sea did not leave them by themselves in the wilderness of Shur. The same God was there. It's what they chose to do Will they give it to God or will they get mad, bitter, and complain? Up to you in your life. Now, I want you to know that not only that, but those uh, that are without Christ know this, that Jesus is the one that makes it sweet. You've never tasted sweet water until you've tasted 
the preciousness of Christ and what he'd done on the cross. And you may be in that bitter sin sea. But God says, I've sent my son to make what's bitter sweet. To make what's bitter sweet. This morning, I believe what God really wants us to grab out of this. Two things. And I believe that he does one of these every single message. First and foremost... If you're lost and undone, he wants to show you the gospel that you may receive him. Secondly, God wants you to learn to trust him no matter what. Trust him no matter what, even when it seems impossible. I know we've got other, we've got people in here that are facing hard things. Uh, uh, Miss Tina back there got great news. Uh, she, she is cancer free now. They do want to do some treatment, not sure what to do, but they did not see any other cancer in her body. God is blessed in that. Amen. Amen. We've got Amy back here that is still going through chemo and still doing things, and it seems like this, this is a huge Mara experience. But I've not seen her one time taste anything bitter. Because she continues to taste the sweetness of God. Even when it looks bitter. You know, her being without a job and not able to work and that sort of stuff. And she's got, I think it's what, five months before uh, uh, any kind of benefits or anything comes in to help her. And I could see where that water could be bitter. But she's not allowing it to taste bitter. Because she knows that God will provide. God will care for. God will take care. God led her to this point. Why would he leave her there in it? The same way with you and your life. Every step you take is ordered by God. So there's not one step that takes him by surprise. So when you're facing difficult and hard times, when you're facing that test or those trials, those hardships, Know this, go straight to him first. Say, God, I don't know what to do, but I know you do. And I'm just simply going to trust you. And you better believe that water will become sweet (laughs) because he wants to provide. He wants you to rely solely upon him that he may love you, cherish you, care for you, show you compassion, and do everything for you. Because he loves you like that. He loves you that much. Matter of fact, y'all can all quote it with me, I guarantee. Romans 5a. God loved us in so much that he sent his son to die upon the cross for us. That we don't have to pay that sin debt ourselves. And we don't have to go to that place called hell. But we can taste and see that the waters of God are sweet. We can taste and see that when we do drink of those waters, that he's paid for it forever for us. And it's something we never have to face again. Lord Jesus, God, I thank you this morning for your word. God, I pray this morning that you would help us, Lord. God, I pray that you would move and work as only you can with every person that's here, God. God, help us just to look in our lives, Lord, and how we handle situations. What are we doing, God? And sometimes uh, when we don't answer correctly, then there's another test and another test and another test. But God, I pray that we would begin to start answering correctly to those tests. God, that we wouldn't have to face another one right away trying to learn the same lesson. Because God, the first time was enough. And we went straight to you. God, I pray this morning, Lord, as we examine our own hearts, examine our own lives, that, God, that we would look in and see that no matter where we're at, we can always trust you. God, we can always rely and depend upon you. So, God, whatever the need is this morning, God, we know that you want to supply God, whatever the the issue at hand is, God, we know you want to fix it. But God, it's all depending on what we do with it. Do we take it to you and reach inside of glory 
and take what it is that you have for us to sweeten. Or God, do we get bitter, upset, angry, or try to do it ourselves? God, help us. God, help us to turn it over to you. God, help us to find you. God, help us. God, to just be obedient and know that you've got this. God, you have your way. In your precious and holy name we do pray. And amen. As we all stand this, this morning, as they begin to sing, I hope you're obedient to the Lord this morning.
anybody in here this morning grateful for the goodness of God? Amen. Amen. Anybody got a word you'd like to share this morning before we dismiss in prayer? All hearts and minds at ease. Well, all right. Uh, don't forget, uh, this meets tonight at 5 o'clock. Uh, uh, service at 6 o'clock. Uh, just be ready and prepared for what God's got for us then. And also, um, trail life meeting for leaders at, right after service uh, in the Sunday school room by my office. So, all right, we'll go to the Lord in prayer and just uh, be dismissed. Brother Casey, we take to the Lord in prayer and dismiss this, please, sir. Amen.